Welcome back everybody to your daily update on the state of the Malazan Empire. And yes, I can say it again because we're wrapping up Kellenberg's Reach and we have an empire again and an emperor. So, ain't that fun. Anyway, this is the end of the Path to Ascendancy stuff and I'll be back on Monday with Knight of Knives or that's kind of the plan there. Um, we'll see <laughs> how all of that works because obviously this video was supposed to be out well, yesterday, I guess. Well, technically Thursday evening, but then, you know, life. <laughs> As they say. So, we'll see how all of that goes. Uh, but now, let's finish that whole thing, shall we? Cheers. <sighs> Alright. So, here we go. Um... First of all, something I forgot with that, like, <laughs> last video, I completely forgot to talk about um, a certain meeting on a certain island with a person in a tent. <laughs> the... Well, there's not that much to talk about there. It certainly is important to understand um, developments of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. So I would say it's a key scene there because it's the first um, interaction of Kellenwert with that particular person. Um, and uh, the idea that Kellenved, while being willing to make deals with all kinds of people, is not willing to um, um, accept that kind of like uh, power. He's not. He's not willing to serve anyone. So a partnership is something he is willing to do because that's what he does with dancer. But a um, that kind of thing doesn't work. And that may just be one of the reasons why things in the Malazan Empire show, uh, you know, are what they are. So, um, uh, there we go. I just needed to be, um, yeah, I just needed to, you know, do that because otherwise I would feel bad for not mentioning it. So, let's have a look at what happened in the rest of the book. Well, obviously, um... We have uh, Kellenved take over the throne of the Trelane Mass. Um, did I mention that before? No, I don't think I did. Um, the throne of the Trelane Mass um, by not doing anything and leaving, leaving them to do their thing. Unless, unless you know, unlike the witch Jardine, who gets killed by Onos Tulan. We also have the first instance of someone calling Onos Tulan Tool. So, you know, <laughs> that was just pretty fun. And I feel like that's sort of what um, the last part of this book does, of Kellenbet's Reach. It kind of wraps up all these things, and I get the criticism of someone like Dr. Philip Chase, who says, like, it feels a bit rushed near the end. I get all of that. Um, because we jump around between all these points, uh, all these different uh, locales, different characters, and especially in the last couple of chapters of Kellen Beth Reach, like so many, I don't want to call it fan service, so, but so many references to later stuff just get dropped in, so we, um, you know, have... Uh, It's so yeah, that fans of the Malazan Book of the Fallen or novels of the Malazan Empire can just, you know, s feel happy about that. All of these small things being um, mentioned at least once. And I get the criticism. I just enjoyed it because I'm a fan and it's pretty cool. Would I wish there to be more about that kind of stuff? Uh, hell yeah. I mean, we've also, also still not talked about... <laughs> Anything that goes on in Falar, I suspect this will be handled in the Gistal. I hope so. I really want to learn more about it. Um, so whenever that comes out, I'm, I'm very much waiting for the Gistal. <laughs> so I'll just say this. But now let's look at some of the interesting aspects here. One of them certainly is... Um, the con continuation of the whole Ulara Crimson Guard part um, that ends with her going literally nowhere. I mean, she goes there and she becomes the new High Priestess of the Jek, which all of that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, that's about it. I 
unless I'm really stupid, which, you know, is possible, um, it's actually very likely, <laughs> uh, but unless I'm very, I have forgotten a lot about the Nals of the Malazan Empire, we never meet her again. I mean, we, do we ever meet Jack in the novels of the Malazan Empire? I don't think so. And I can't remember if she shows up in Witness in uh, The God Is Not Willing, but I don't think so either. Um, so yeah. Um, but we still have that whole idea of um, um, agency and overprotectiveness that um, we have with the whole idea of the whole question of whether that is correct or not to keep her in the castle because um, she's obviously blind and whether to do that or not we have that discussion obviously obviously her between um, the mage and Seth and it's still you know I still feel very strongly about that um, so does that dog apparently I hope they're fine <laughs> Anyway, uh, my point is that she gets set free again and she does her whole thing then and that's really a good end for that particular uh, character arc. We also have the whole thing going on with... Um, Greymane and doing his thing, we have the whole treachery around that siege that ends up um, uh, with Gregor and Haraj ending up with the Crimson Guard after a while. Um, which once again, we come to the point where um, we we get shown in a lot of ways how um, the um, very rigid system uh, of the, those small baronies, those, that rigid feudal system is so ripe for an attack from an outside agent like the Malazan forces that don't play according to those rules. That recognize talent over rank, which we see, like, you know, in the whole Malazan stuff later on, and which, you know, you can find somewhat in the, the Roman Empire or what have you. Um, but the whole idea of it being about merit and not uh, birth is really important here because we uh, we see those like traditional kingdoms fighting each other um, while everyone loses who is not a nobleman and talented people like Gregor, Haraj possibly, definitely um, Greymane are um, you know are dismissed or wasted in a lot of ways and um, then we see the two main people at this point which also sets up that great rivalry later on the two groups that don't work according to that are the crimson guard that is very much about <coughs> merit as well and the malazans who hire or pick up Greymane and his surviving people and the dark side of merit, obviously, is uh, is that whole like end justifying means and whatnot um, that we see with the uh, the Crimson Guard taking on Skinner and his gang, who obviously shows up here, and we already know that Skinner is bad news. Is he a very very powerful fighter? Yes, he is. <clears throat> but is that all? Probably not. Um, which. I guess is what we see on the other side with the Malazans. I mean, obviously not everything is good that goes on in the Malazan Empire, um, but at least at this point we still have Dasim, who is very much not only about skill, but also about rigid morals and, and things like that, which are important if you want to keep the power that comes with being good at weapons and shit in some sort of, under some sort of control, is you need to have rigid morals and um, a code of conduct and have not having that is a problem. Now we obviously don't see any of that happening here at, in Calumet's Reach because it only ends with Skinner and his gang showing up. But it's certainly something we'll see more about uh, later on in the novels of the Malazan Empire where that conflict is explored because if you look at it 
from that point of view, the, the, the great antagonists in the future are not the Malazan Empire versus the rest of, you know, all those continents they conquer. It's very much the Crimson Guard as that one place, one thing they never, they, they never can conquer, right? They, they never get to. That's the Crimson Guard. So, and, and the reason why that works is that the Crimson Guard, once again, is very much um, about merit and quality over, like, conventional, um, you know, traditions of rank, uh, well, rank, obviously, but, you know, traditions of birth and uh, family and all that shit. So, what we see here at the end of Kelimbert's Reach is the birth of that um, era of merit-based uh, systems versus the base, you, you know, the end of that family-based, nobility-based feudal system. And at least the early years of the Malazan Empire into the, the reign of um, the Empress are still plagued by the attempts of that old system of nobility through nepotism, through money and whatnot to undermine that strict reliance on merit and quality. Um, so this is something that we'll see more of, but it's it's certainly you know the kind of the kind of how to say um, conflict we have in our world. I don't want to say at the end of the Middle Ages because the Middle Ages are such a loose term, but we certainly have that with like a the slow like downfall of feudalism, the rise of mercantilism. When you look at you know your your sixteenth, seventeenth, well mostly fifteenth, sixteenth century, I would say is kind of the era where we see things like that starting. They obviously take a lot longer, like a couple centuries more in the real world to work out. And you can totally make arguments that <laughs> we're still not yet done with that because capitalism in a way takes over that role and establishes new families, new dynasties and whatnot, where once again, merit is no longer what we, what we are basing our like structures, our power structures on. So that's like the overall thing that I see at the end, and I feel that you can make an argument um, against the idea of it being too scattered and too rushed. Now, this is exactly um, the kind of um, um, atmosphere, the kind of feeling that um, Ian Esselmund wants to actually portray here, is that idea that the 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 closing age of feudalism on Quantali, of all these different states, city-states and whatnot, um, is very chaotic. It is all over the place. It is hectic, it is chaotic, it is very much small picture stuff, if you want to call it that, uh, to use a Terry Pratchett, you know, term here. It's it's very much that. And the what, what will be coming is the rise of the Malazan Empire, which for Quantali and other places like that will be very much a restoration of peace and a more stately um, pace in daily life. So having that contrast kind of set up with a more like rushed and chaotic ending of Kelenbed's Reach, I feel could be, could be deliberate. It could still be like the question of why not add another 100 pages or whatever. Um, as well, but, you know, I just wanted to point out that that is a way you can see that. Alright, another thing that we need to talk about here is um, representation. Because there's some of that going on that I found, like, interesting to just point out. One of them is um, in Origins... Um, Greymane's band with the Prevost, whose name I keep forgetting, and the Unturned Duelist, those two women that for a while we could set up that there is some kind of tension going on there. And it is sometimes um, hinted um, or whatever that it is some kind of rivalry between the two women, maybe for Greymane's affection, maybe not. Um, but at the end, when Tenneth, Territh, Something like that. Um, when she dies, in like because she's taking over the rear guard, 
at the end, she um, kisses uh, the uh, Prevost Gerald. Cheryl? I think that's her name. Anyway, she kisses her and is like, yeah, I always love those braids. Which I found well made because it it kind of shows how we in a more like, still like rather heterosexually, you know, structured or whatever uh, world interpret that from like maybe mostly a heteros heteronormative perspective, maybe even more like a male perspective, which I obviously have, how we would see that rivalry between those, or like that tension between those two women, and how we misinterpret, misinterpret that tension between those two women. <clears throat> and it just gets flipped in the last, si yeah, you know, situation, with no further comment on it. This is not, you know, we're putting this in here to make a big point, we're just like showing that this is how it is, and it's left to the to the reader, to put it into some kind of perspective. So that's something that I found interesting. And another thing that I wanted to point out when it comes to representation of stuff like that is with Eco, right? So Eco Shimmer <coughs> gets kicked out because of her like thing out of the out of service of the king. Um Chilon the fourth. Um by machination, by the nobility, because once again we are in a situation in Itkokan where the sword dances in a way are very much merit-based and um, the old hierarchical families don't want to, you know, <laughs> bow to that. So through that intrigue, Iko gets kicked out because she is obviously there before with no, like, family dynastical affiliations. And after getting very drunk, and she ends up as a um, bodyguard and enforcer for a crime organization in Cannes. Which, you know, you can certainly talk about whether that is a bit cliched with her getting drunk and then being, you know, dragged into that. Um, nice touch that the um, boss of this uh, organization is a woman. But interesting is the one person in there that we're talking about, that being, is it called Lilac, Lila, something like that, um, whom Eko first sees as a man. And during that time, um, the person is always described with the pronouns of he. And then when we come back to Eko, we have like that narrative that she talks to the people and starts to, you know, learn more about them and learns that that person wants to be um, addressed as she because she wants to be, she thinks of herself or feels like a woman. And from that point onwards, whenever the person is mentioned, they are using um, the, the pronoun, the female pronouns are used, which once again is not a big deal, but it's certainly something that I found interesting to have in there because it's, it's, it's rather low key, but it's, it's handled in the correct way. It's like you, you you switch you use the pronouns a person wants to uh, to be used for them as soon as you find out that they want that that's the point eco doesn't know at the beginning once she knows we switch the perspective which you know i think is really good then obviously um this is one thing that i'm kind of sad that we didn't get to see that um, how Eko joins the Crimson Guard, how Shimmer becomes, you know, what happens between Shimmer's failure to protect the king because the king dies, <clears throat> the coup is, well, not really successful because um, the king is dead, but also, like, the family that organized, that, that orchestrated the coup is also diminished brutally by um, uh, Eko. But once again, we come to that point where, like, feudal family strife and conflict has made it very, very easy for the Malazan Empire to step in and bring what is lacking in all these, like, feudal fights. That is stability. The Malazan Empire brings stability, which is the thing that made other empires all over the, all over the world so successful, you know, when they were successful, like the Roman Empire. They brought stability to... Um, from the outside, but you know, they brought stability and a paradigm shift in a lot of ways of how to handle things. And that is something that your um, average person in every place in life really values, which you know has its disadvantages, but you know, sometimes stability or offering stability is pretty good.
So, two more things to talk about. Um, the attack on corn, uh, or maybe more than two things. So, the attack on corn, but also our first connection with the Moranth. We now figure out um, how that first alliance with the Moranth um, was forged. It was forged by Dancer and Kellenved when they end up, after being kicked from um, that island, uh, um, they end up on that um, weird, like, peninsula close to Stratum and um, are found by the Moran, who are also stranded there. Calumet helps them out, and everyone's favorite Moran, um, Twist, whom we meet again in later books, is part of that. So that's where that deal comes from that helps later on with the Moran. So, you know, what, another one of those, like, we need to kind of answer that question, which you can see as feeling rushed. On the other hand, it could have just as well been left out if that's so your point, so I don't, I don't mind it being in there. Anyway, just um, to see where all these things come from, to answer all those questions of, like, why is the Malazan Empire the way it is, <clears throat> once we start with um, these other books, I feel is important. Now, where are we going with the next thing? Um, yes, the attack on Corn, which is fucking ruthless. And this is, I guess, a very important aspect that so far is easy to forget when you read um, these uh, three books, Path to Ascendancy, because Kellenved Wu um, comes across as a rather whimsical, chaotic person. Well, obviously he has a drive towards, um, a drive to power, and he he is ambitious as all hell. But he's also very whimsical and almost, almost like a comic relief from time to time. And it's one of these scenes that established that the Emperor, or the soon-to-be Emperor Kellenved, is very ruthless, not afraid to spend lives if it helps him later, He, you know. He uses arguments of, you know, um, better to do that once, so everyone knows and we're, you know... Um, we don't have to kill as many people later on. And you can make those arguments, but they are, they are always uh, very, very uh, problematic arguments to make. It's like, kill a hundred people now, so you don't have to kill, like, over the next ten years, ten thousand people. It's like, yeah, I, I get it. It still very much sucks for the, ten, for the hundred people. We also obviously have that situation that Corn is somewhat of like it's a merchant city. We already know that um, merchants are not the most beloved people in the Malazan world. So it's yeah, you know, we're not killing a hundred ki uh, children there. Well, probably a lot of children died in that attack as well. But you, you know, it's still very ruthless, and it's important to have a scene like that in there so we know that Kellenved is absolutely ruthless, not just bumbling around in shadow and having dancers safe his ass all the time. And from there on out, we have the attack of Li Hang, the city, the story ending in Li Hang, where it all started earlier on, we have the first showing up of the Talame mass. And something that is really important there, that's established here, and that we see later on as well, when it's like, why did the, uh, the Tlana Mass just march off into the Jag, Odan, or whatever, what is mentioned in later books. It's like, the Tlana Mass are on their, like, overall job to still hunt the Jagud. So they only work for the Emperor as long as the Emperor does not... Um, want them to do something that will <coughs> prevent them from 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 fulfilling their um, purpose, and we see how he kind of tricks them into not a, not even killing someone in in Li Hang, but um, just showing up because he claims that he's seen a Jagut, and we know there was a Jagut outside of Li Hang, because we've seen the scene with, um, at the opening of uh, Dance's Lament, right? So they show up, everyone's scared to hell, they take care of um, the protectress, who is a Thais Liosan. She either kills herself, 
or just actually goes back into Curel Leosan that's kind of left in the open. And they just march in and take over. The Emperor just take, marches in and takes over because he was underestimated once again. And we're good with that, right? Plus, we have that really ridiculous scene with um, Imperial, <laughs> or not even Imperial, but uh, Historian Heboric, who gets thrown into the prison immediately for being a smartass, I guess. Well, he's right. <laughs> but the problem is, <laughs> right and wrong don't mean a lot if you have an emperor in front of you. We have that whole scene of Kellenberg becoming an emperor and then being pissed off, you know, being bored by administration after two days, which is where we leave them when they decide to go and explore shadows. Shadow, which is, you know, the way to... Uh, Um, where we lead over into what happens later on. All the majors are on their way to where they want to be. Smokey and Mara go off to join the Crimson Guard. Silk goes somewhere in Corn, probably working for the Malazans. Um, Coral has already left to the north to whatever he's going to do there. And Ho is sent to Oshaterral Island, where he has to be for. I guess Return of the Crimson Guard? Something like that. And this is where we leave it. So let's let's think about what I liked about this book and the whole series uh, before we wrap this up for today. So, I still think that Dance's Lament is my favorite book out of this trilogy. Um, because I really appreciate the tight focus and everything. I think I like this one a bit more than uh, Dead House Landing. For, like, the perspective on Quantali, a place that we haven't spent a lot of time on before, all these things I really enjoyed. Greymane's a cool character. Gregor and Haraj trying to um, join the Crimson Guard. Makes for some really interesting things. The the, the attention paid to stuff like um, uh, medieval combat and everything made it like a very fascinating and interesting and light read. I really enjoyed all of that. So, if I would have to rate them, which I don't, or rank them, I would say it's Dance's Lament, then Kelmet's Reach, and then Dead House Landing in between. <laughs> but then again, being the middle book in a trilogy is always kind of the difficult part, I guess. It's like very few times that I appreciate the middle part of a trilogy the most. I guess um, Empire Strikes Back being one of the few exceptions to that one. Um, um, but yeah, there we go with that part. Um, now let's look at the trilogy in overall. So I personally really enjoy the Path to Ascendancy series. It does a lot of things really well. It is a great introduction into the Malazan world. It sets up a lot of things in a really well, a great way. And because it is rather short, like all three novels together are probably as long as like one of the, you know, larger, longer Malazan Book of the Fallen books. Um, so they're an easy entry point because committing to a, I don't know, 10 book series or a six book series even though the novels of the Malazan Empire are obviously all standalone novels, you don't have to read the entire series. Um, committing to something like that is not everyone's, you know, not everyone wants to do that. But um, the Path to Ascendancy is an easy way to get started with that, as technically would be the Carcanus trilogy if it was already finished. And I would never say that the Kurtikanas trilogy is not an easy read. I think it is a rather easier read than the Malazan Book of the Fallen. And I would say the Path to Ascendancy series is also an easier read than the novels of the Malazan Empire or the Malazan Book of the Fallen. So I think it's a great introduction. It does not yet deal with themes as mature and brutal as Carcanus or Malazan Book of the Fallen or some of the later stuff in the novels of the Malazan Empire. So there's that. 
which may also be a good reason why this is a good introductory introductory series. I um, don't think it's a good idea to you know denigrate that series um, because you th say it's not as deep or as complex or what have you as the Malazan Book of the Fallen or whatever. That's not its point, and that doesn't make it a. <laughs> less amazing book or whatever if you are into like reading super thick dense novels then maybe this is not the best book you'll ever read in that case you can go and read infinite jest maybe if you really want to suffer for a while that's fine but that doesn't make the path to ascendancy a bad series it's a great series it's a fun series it sparks the imagination and adds a lot of facets to the malazan universe and shows a lot of interesting, you know, foundations for stuff that will happen later on and helps to explain specific characters. Like, reading these books and reading the novels of the Malazan Empire as well has given me a way different and more, I would say, more rounded perspective on someone like um, Surly, for example. And I appreciate that. And... Once again, this makes a lot of sense. The tone is a different one. But we're talking about history. We're talking about histories, different histories or historiographies of dis uh, different parts and aspects and different facets and eras of the Malazan world. And they are all different for all kinds of reasons. So this makes a lot of sense. So to really wrap it up, Go read Path to Ascendancy, although now that I'm saying this at the end of the whole thing, I guess you already have, so good on you. <laughs> anyway, I think it's a great book, and I can't wait for the next Esselmont novel. I really hope Gistel will come out soon. Um, I wish you a great Saturday, and I'll be back with other stuff, even maybe later today, but definitely tomorrow. And until then, cheers.